Okay, welcome. We're we're officially at 8:30 p.m. Couple quick announcements. Hello. We're officially. We're officially at 8.30 p.m. My name's Ron, I'm an alcoholic. I'd like to welcome you all here. I apologize for having to squish in this room. Every March, every year, Code Blue, the church does this service for the homeless people. It's a pretty noble cause, and we have to squish in here. We actually got the air on tonight, so we'll stay nice and comfortable. But anyway, just be mindful of that. Uh, just once a year. This is, I talked to a lady today. This will probably be our last week in here. So we'll back to our normal side on, the, on there. We have a Facebook page if you want to keep <coughs> informed and see where the meeting's going to be or which door to enter on. We post it on there. Nobody ever looks. But it's the Conscious Contact Speaker Group of Doylestown. You know, they can come and they pull the door like, hey, what's... Anyway, it's really good to be informed and see what's going on. There's events going on up and down AA, all up and down the coast. We post it in there. If you have any events, any flyers, we love anniversaries, <laughs> workshops, big book workshops, conventions, let us know. It keeps everybody connected in AA. If you're bored in AA, you don't, have, you don't know what to do or you're not having fun, go on there, there's stuff to do. Anyway, uh, we have a, the one bathroom that belongs to the church. They have it cleaned on a Saturday and they don't let us use it because of the fact that over the over years they, they left it pretty messy for the congregation that comes here Sunday morning. But we do have to kind of use it this week, so please be mindful. They're down the hallway here, but leave them as clean as possibly as you can. Don't throw anything in there for us because we love this group, we love this church, and we work together with them, and they give us they give us the use of this place. So just be mindful of that. I don't think I got anything else to uh, announce. Scott is going to handle this tonight. Sit down and relax. Hi. All right, everybody. Hi, my name is Scott, and I'm an alcoholic. Hey, good evening, everybody. Glad you're here. This is a one-hour speaker meeting that meets every Saturday evening at St. Paul's Lutheran Church, 301 North Main Street, at 8:30 in Doylestown, PA. The business meeting for this group meets every Saturday at 7 p.m. to 7.30 right here. The purpose of the group is to provide a consistent message of hope and recovery through God-reliance and service to others through the practice and teaching of the 12 steps. We record all speakers so that others may benefit from their message of recovery. If you wish not to be recorded, simply ask. This is an open meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous. The group would like to welcome everyone, especially newcomers. Is there anyone new or from out of town that would like to introduce themselves with their first name? Kevin, welcome. In the back? Mark, welcome. In the middle. Greg, welcome. Hey, Bill, welcome. Hey, Bill, welcome. Ricardo, alcoholic. Ricardo, welcome, brother. Terry, alcoholic. Terry, welcome, brother. Good. Hey, hey welcome. welcome. All right, welcome, you guys. Awesome. We got one more over here. Hey, Terry, welcome, brother. All right, we got everybody. Excellent. The Conscious Contact Speaker Group encourages sponsorship. Would anyone with working knowledge of the 12 steps and is willing to sponsor, please raise your hands. All right. Definitely got enough sponsors in here. That's great. Are there any announcements for the good of AA? My name's Heather. I'm an alcoholic. Heather. Um, the shameless plug for the next nine months. Pennsylvania won the conference um, for ECPA. If you don't know what ECPA is, it's the Eastern Area Conference of Young People and Alcoholics Anonymous. Um, it was just held in Atlantic City this uh, past weekend. It was phenomenal. It was like 2,000 people that showed up. Um, definitely life changing. But so Pennsylvania won. So it's going to be hosted in Pennsylvania in 2020. Um, and, you know, it starts now. Um, there's a lot that needs to be done. There's a lot of planning and stuff like that. So I tentatively will be on the host committee. Um, if you have any questions, if you want to know more about it, what it is, what it entails, um, just come find me. That's all. Thanks, Heather. You have a mess in the back? Leah, Leah, Leah. Yeah. Real quick, Sunday, March 31st in Chalfon, um, there is a, the 46th anniversary. There is going to be food, dessert, <coughs> fellowship, a lot of good food, starting at 6.30 p.m. and a regular meeting, a speaker meeting at 7.30 p.m. Two, two really good speakers. I want to see you all there. All right, thank you. Thanks, Anybody else? All right. All right, we have meeting lists and big books on easy terms. Please see me or any home group member after the meeting. If you cannot afford a big book, the Conscious Contact Speaker Group will give you one at no charge. Anyone willing to take donations for the purchase of big books and CDs to help those who can't afford them can put donations in the jar on the table marked Big Book and CD Donations. If you'd like a CD of any speaker, past or present, see me or Ron after the meeting. 
They're available, they are available free of charge. And I've asked Brian to come up and read the preamble, please. All right. Good evening, everybody. My name is Brian, and I am an alcoholic. And this is the AA preamble. Alcoholics Anonymous is a fellowship of men and women who share their experience, strength, and hope with each other that they may solve their common problem and help others to recover from alcoholism. The only requirement for AA membership is a desire to stop drinking. There are no dues or fees for AA membership. We are self-supporting through our own contributions. AA is not allied with any sect, denomination, politics, organization, or institution, does not wish to engage in any controversy, neither endorses nor opposes any causes. Our primary purpose is to stay sober and to help other alcoholics to achieve sobriety. And uh, I'm not sure who's coming up. Scott's going to come up here and read the 12 steps. I'm Scott, I'm an alcoholic. It's the AA 12 Steps of Recovery. One, we admitted we are powerless over alcohol, that our lives have become unmanageable. Two, came to believe that our power greater than ourselves could restore us to sanity. Three, made a decision to turn our will and our lives over the care of God as we understood Him. Four, made a searching and fearless moral inventory of ourselves. Five, admitted to God, to ourselves, and to another human being the exact nature of our wrongs. Six, we're entirely ready to have God remove all these defects of character. 7. Humbly asked him to remove our shortcomings. 8. Made a list of all persons we had harmed and became willing to make amends to them all. 9. Made, made direct amends to such people wherever possible except when to do so would injure them or others. 10. Continued to take personal inventory and when we were wrong promptly admitted it. 11. Sought through prayer and meditation to improve our conscious contact with God as we understood and praying only, only for knowledge of his will for us and the power to carry that out. 12. Having had a spiritual awakening as a result of these steps, we tried to carry this message to alcoholics and to practice these principles in all our affairs. All right, the seventh tradition. Every AA group ought to be fully self-supporting, declining outside contributions. At this time, I would like to pass the basket. We have new dues or fees, but we have expenses. This group provides many services. Your donations cover rent, big books, CDs, events, and workshops, etc. And there is absolutely no smoking on the church property. And please take a moment to silence all your cell phones and limit movement during the meeting to avoid distractions. <clears throat> and... Uh, now I want to introduce uh, our good friend of the Conscious Contact Speaker Group of Doylestown, Iris W. from Colts Neck, New Jersey. Thank you. Oh, uh -oh I did it. That's it. <laughs> Is that a bad sign? No. Shoo. Hi, everybody. I'm Iris, and I'm an alcoholic. Hi, Iris. And just so you know, I do speak a little low. Thank you. I do speak a little low. So if I start getting lower, which I sometimes have the tendency to do, um, just tell me. Just yell at me. Um, I got real thick skin. I'm not sensitive. Uh, so just let me know because, again, I have the habit of doing that. And I know there's a lot of people <clears throat> out in the uh, hallway. So let me know. Um, once again, I'm Iris. I'm an alcoholic. My sobriety date is April 17th, 1995. And I can tell you that the only reason I'm standing here today is because of good sponsorship. A sponsor who took the time, invested time in me, and introduced me to a God of my understanding. That's what, that's what they did for me. Um, and he did that through the uh, 12 steps as outlined in the... Uh, big book and we spent some time and I want to thank Ron for for asking me I met him at a Quaker town um, which I met a whole bunch of very 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 nice people out there and before I forget because I forget I want to thank Lauren and Stephanie and Charles and Maureen for schlepping um, up here or down here I'm from Brooklyn everything's <laughs> up I never know where I am the Brooklyn will come out um, <coughs> So they were making fun of me at the place we just ate, something about the word salsa, and also not a great idea to have a quesadilla before you get up to speak. I'm um, just throwing that out there. Um, still don't always have the greatest ideas, um, but hey. So thanks for taking the drive with me, and thanks for introducing me and bringing me over to uh, Quaker, Quaker Town. Um, my home group, 
steps by the book over in Colts Neck. If you're ever in Colts Neck, we'd love to have you. Just a little um, tidbit, what we do is on Tuesday nights we sit down and somebody shares their experience with the uh, specific uh, chapter or step out of the book. Um, and that's what we do on Tuesday and Thursday is an open speaker meeting. So if you're ever in Colts Neck, look me up. Um, love to meet you. All right, um, so I had my first drink when I was 12. And uh, <laughs> it's kind of funny. I always think about it because my uh, anniversary date is April 17th, always around um, Easter and Passover. And my first drink was at a Passover Seder. And I was 12 years old, and I was in Massachusetts. Uh, I know I say that funny. And I was in Massachusetts, and we were drinking that Manischewitz wine. You know the good stuff? The stuff that straws stand up on, that you can smell it if you open it in the kitchen, you can smell it in the living room. But that's what we were drinking. <clears throat> and that's what we always drink at Passover Seder's, if you've ever been to one. And we were down in Massachusetts at, uh, at cousins who were very religious. You know, I was raised, I was raised Jewish. Um, and I remember we sat around the table and I thought to myself, here's another, you know, we, we never look forward to that. What's a Passover Seder for people who don't know what a Passover Seder is? It's kind of like a big book meeting. Um, I'll explain. It's kind of like a big book meeting. You go around and you go around the table and everybody reads a paragraph and what you do is you follow the directions that's in that book. But one of the directions in that book is drink your wine. Um, finish your glass of wine. Fill your <coughs> glass of wine. Um, finish your glass of wine. And there's about 12 glasses of that good Manischewitz throughout the whole Seder. Okay? And I was sitting next to um, my cousin's boyfriend, may she rest in peace, and he thought it would be really cute to get the 12 year old drunk. And he did. Not that I said no. Um, and I kept drinking and he kept filling and I kept drinking and he kept filling. And you know, they had these, you know those tall, tall poodles? Um, they're supposed to be really smart. I, it's funny because after all these years, I still remember his name. His name is Lancelot. And Lancelot had this thing that as soon as you came through the door, he liked to grab your leg and do that dog thing to it. <laughs> yeah, he was so smelly, boy. And I remember he was under the table where I was sitting and he grabbed my leg and he did the dog thing. And he proceeded to do it until he brought me under the table. Um, yeah, it was something I remember today. <laughs> and I remember my mother taking me from under the table and putting me down in the basement. And I remember being so sick. I was so sick. Um, I didn't vomit, but the room was spinning. You know, all that great stuff. And I remember on the drive home from Massachusetts to Brooklyn, I remember my mother saying to my father, she'll never do that again. She learned a lesson. Look how sick she is. She'll never do that again. And I didn't do that again for four more years. And then at 16, I did it again. Um, and I didn't stop until 1995. You know, I don't come from a dysfunctional family. I can't tell you I come from a dysfunctional family. You know, I've had the privilege and the honor of sponsoring hundreds of women and listening to lots of fist steps. And there are some people that came from dysfunction. I didn't. I didn't. I have two wonderful parents. I still do. You know, the only dysfunction in their family is standing right here, right in front of you. Um, I've no one to blame. You know, it's funny. It's kind of funny. I'm adopted. I'll touch on it quickly. But, uh, you know, it really doesn't mean much. You know, I, anytime <coughs> I ever did the therapist thing, because, you know, it's not the alcohol. It's probably what someone did to me, and I should go see a shrink. And then I would lie to the shrink, or I'd give him something to talk about. And something we were able to talk about was the fact that I was adopted. And I wasn't, it wasn't anything dramatic. I was adopted at birth. And I was born in Portland, Maine, in the Irish capital of Portland, Maine. And um, I always used to say to my parents, um, and my parents are very religious, still, still to date, you know. Um, and they used to say, no, we got you from a very lovely Jewish family in Portland, Maine. And, you know, as I got older, I used to think to myself, I don't know, you know. So I went back and I visited the hospital. My son got 
had a great idea to join the Green, Green Berets. And when he did that, I decided I needed to leave the state of New Jersey or I was going to follow him. And uh, I decided to go see the hospital I was born in. And I remember when I first pulled into Portland, I ended up going with my ex-husband. Um, I thought to myself, hmm, it doesn't look like there's any Jews around here. <laughs> and then I was walking and my friend over there, Maureen, I saw this thing on the news in the morning and it said that any adoptee can get that ancestry DNA thing. And I remember saying to Maureen, I should do that. You know, shut my mother down once and for all because it's that important. Um, and she got it for me for, I don't know, my birthday or something. I can't remember. Some, something. And I did it. And lo and behold, I'm 78% Irish. And the rest is Scottish. So I was sitting with my sponsor the other day at a meeting, and the speakers were from Far Rockaway, um, Queens, the other Irish capital of the world. And I remember they were talking about being Irish, Irish Catholic. And I turned to her and I said, do you know, I'm Irish Catholic too. And she just started cracking up. You know, it's like, it's like I think about everywhere that I've come from and, and what I was taught as I was growing up. And thank God for Alcoholics Anonymous that taught me to get rid of all that stuff, if that makes any sense. You know, thank God for good sponsorship that sat down and took all that nonsense away and led me to a God of my understanding. It doesn't matter. As a matter of fact, I was adopted and born in Portland, Maine. It's cute. You know, it's always nice. It's fun. You know, I found my half-quarter sister. I don't know. She's not, so I wish I didn't find her. Um, <laughs> it's like I, I have enough. Um, I had to go look for more. Um, you know, so cute and fun until you find it. Um, but, you know, thank God for what I've learned here. You know, I said I continued to drink. I started drinking again at 16. The horse was out of the barn. You know, I grew up in Brooklyn. You know, hanging out was an activity. Uh, we hung out on street corners. <coughs> when we got old enough, we went to Manhattan. We had nothing no different than anybody else. You had fake IDs. But the difference was that I would have to start drinking before we even started doing anything. Like everybody else would wait. I couldn't wait. I couldn't wait. I had to start drinking. And then as I got older and older, you know, and I started going out, and we started going, you know, through the tunnels and over the bridges. I was the chick that you left in the car because I was a blackout drinker right out of the gate. Bless you. It's the way I drank. I didn't know to drink. I didn't, couldn't drink any other way, you know. It was never enough until I blacked out. I don't even know. I can't even stand here and tell you that I ever humored myself and said, I'll control it. I mean, I went through a couple of spouts with my... Um, with my uh, ex-husband where I'd say, like, I'd be good, I'd be good, I'd be good. But I was never capable of doing it. You know, I um, married my drinking buddy, very young. Uh, <coughs> we moved from Brooklyn, because it was Brooklyn that was the problem. So we went over the bridge to Jersey. And um, I really didn't like New Jersey. And I blame New Jersey, by the way, for my drinking then seven days a week. Um, because it's because of New Jersey, not having schoolyards or sidewalks or stoops, that made me start drinking seven days a week. Um, and that's what I started doing when I got here. <coughs> you know, if I really think about it, obviously I'd still be drinking if alcohol was still working for me. But it stopped. You know, a lot of people, like one of, one of my sponsors, um, he, he always knew he can sit here and he can tell you the progression. He was very specific about it. Um, but I can't tell you the progression. I can't tell you when I passed over that fine line when alcohol is, you know, you know, ceased to be a luxury. It became a necessity. Um, I can't tell you. I just know it happened. And when it happened and I kept saying that I was going to stop and I couldn't stop, I was just as surprised as everybody else. You know, and that's when I started blaming things. You know, my parents would come out on the weekends from, from Brooklyn. They were both school teachers. They would come out on their holidays, whatever be the case. And they used to say to me, you know, you drink a lot. And I used to say, it's only during the weekends. But it wasn't. It was all 
you know, and then they would come out during Easter vacation or whatever be the case, and they said, I thought you were only drinking during the weekends, and I'd be like, it's a holiday, you know, the whole week, so we're drinking the whole week, you know, and I would just, you know, keep doing that. And, you know, as soon as the alcohol, I remember my kids, I had, I, I did everything, I did everything everybody did, you know, I got married, I moved, um, I have two wonderful children, God truly blessed me. You know, I always say I must have done something right. Um, I have two really great kids, and I can talk about them probably forever. And, you know, I had them and figured, I, you know, as a mother, there's, there's, there's nothing, nothing or anybody I love more in this world than my kids. And if I couldn't stop drinking for my kids, I couldn't stop drinking for anything or for anybody, you know? And they wanted me to stop drinking. And they would ask me to stop drinking, and I couldn't stop drinking. And they put me to bed at night. And I used to say, well, you know, my drinking's not affecting anybody's life. <coughs> you know, I don't drink and drive. Um, I haven't gotten arrested. I haven't done anything bad. I mean, what's the big deal? But see, I was doing that. You know, we would lock the, lock the doors and lock the windows at 4 o'clock, and we weren't allowed out, and I would start drinking. You know, and it's funny, I, I always tell this story. Whenever we would hear that there's a big snowstorm coming, you know how everybody runs out and gets milk and bread and there's nothing on the shelf. It's just nothing. There's no water, there's no milk, there's no bread, there's nothing. Well, I would run out and I would get beer and wine and vodka and I would bring it home and I would load up the refrigerators, including the one in the garage. You never know. It could be a bad storm. And then my husband would come home from Manhattan where he would work after, a, you know, a 15-hour day, and he'd look at me and say, did you get any food? Like, is there food? You know, there's a storm coming. Is there food? Are you going to send me out? You know, there's, there's like, you know, two feet of snow, and I'd be like, I didn't have time to get the food. I kind of forgot. You know, the kids were tired. We had to come home. And, you know, I, I, I didn't think. I didn't think about feeding the kids. I didn't think about feeding the dogs. I didn't think about feeding the husband. I thought about the alcohol because that's what my life was, you know? You know, I always believe that God put people in my life, you know, the good, the bad, the ugly. But you know, I just never paid attention. And I remember the first time I went to the doctor and I said to him, I think I drink too much. And he goes, well, how much do you drink? And I said, you know, a bottle of wine a night. Eh, he's like, that's not so bad. Pull it back a little bit. And then I went back and I said, I tried to pull it back a little bit and I can't pull it back. And I lied, you know, I'm drinking more. And he said to me, um, you know, I was having these crazy dreams and um, I didn't sleep all night. All I did, was, all I did was, was drink and then I would sleep during the day. And, you know, the kids wouldn't get to school. And, <clears throat> I mean, my husband would be leaving for the city and leave the crazy lady at home. And, I'm, you know, it was really scary. So I remember I went to see um, a doctor. Finally, the doctor said, and he sent me to a doctor. And for the first time in my life, somebody got honest with me. And he said to me, um, you're drunk. You're an alcoholic. And I was aghast. And I'm like, you know, I was adopted. I was adopted. You know, I can probably have mental illness in my family. And that's probably why I don't sleep and I see things. And I'm probably drinking to make those things go away. And he said, nope, you're an alcoholic. That's what you are. You have to go to detox. I said, I can't go to detox. I'm a great mother. <laughs> I'm a great mother. I am on that couch 24-7. How could I possibly go to detox? What would they do without me? <laughs> I, I, who would get the food? Um, and he looked at me and he said, you have seven days. How about we make a deal? For seven days, you don't drink. You come see me. You have somebody to drive you? Why would I need someone to drive me? He said, you're going to need someone to drive you. And you're going to have to come here, and you're going to have to go see the doctor. And I did. And now I know why he did. Because for seven days, I didn't sleep. I couldn't eat. I saw things crawling up the wall. You know? It was the most horrifying. Woke up screaming, sweating. Um, I used to walk circles around the house. That's all I knew to do. And again, my wonderful parents came out and spent the whole seven days with me, <clears throat> and then took me back to the doctor, and he said to me, you look a little bit better, um, you got to go to an AA meeting, 
And I went, oh? He's like, because I had this book, How to Quit Drinking Without AA. And I thought, I got it. Seriously, Barnes & Noble sold it, I got it. And he said, yeah, no, we made a deal. And I'll never forget him. Seriously, I won't. You know, I went back to thank him. You know, he, he tried to put me on medication. Um, I was never a good medication girl. Uh, really the opposite. I, I was petrified of medication. And I would say to him, I can't take it, my hair's falling out. And he'd be like, do you think maybe your hair's falling out from 20-something years of drinking? Yeah. No, no, no. No, it's, it's whatever this is. And he'd be like, all right, let's not do it. And he'd say, let's, so you've got to go to AA. And he told me where to go, and he gave me the address. And I remember I did a couple of drive-bys. Now remember, I told you I'm from Brooklyn. I'm really tough. I'm a tough girl from Brooklyn. You know, I was in a lot of places I shouldn't have been with a lot of people I didn't belong with. <coughs> and I kind of had this delusion and I was tough. Mm -hmm. Wow. Walking into my first AA meeting, I wasn't tough. <coughs> Excuse me, I'm sorry. I walked in. <coughs> and I wanted... <coughs> I wanted a hole to open up and I wanted to jump in. Choking to death. <laughs> it must be the case. Yeah. <clears throat> you know, I drove around and I drove around, and if anybody knows, you know, the uh, clubhouse, it was in a strip mall in uh, Freehold, in Freehold Borough. And I remember it had two doors, you know, so I wanted to find the back door because I didn't want to come in the front door. Because I came in the front door, you might see me. So I wanted to come in the back door, you know. So I drove around, drove around, and I noticed all these people standing in the back, smoking. And I said, that has to be the front door. Has to be. So I'll go in the other side, when there were no people at all. Though to me, it kind of looked like the front door, I'm just saying. And I remember I waited till exactly, it was a 12.30 meeting. I waited to 12.30, and I opened the door. Now. You all know what happens during Alcoholics Anonymous meeting. Everyone's settling. People are coming in. You always turn around to see who comes in. Well, I didn't know that. And I remember everything was set up because it was the front door. <coughs> and I remember I opened the door and I walked in and everybody turned around and they looked at me. And I wanted to die. I wanted to die. I was petrified. You know, somebody who I will remember to date always. Whenever I see him, I thank him. Jimmy got up and he gave me his seat. And at least if I was sitting, I was a little less obvious. When I ran around the room, I had no problem saying, I'm an alcoholic. I just didn't know why. See, I don't know why. I didn't know why I had to go out, you know, before a snowstorm and buy 24 beers. I didn't know why <clears throat> when I only had two beers in the refrigerator. And then I would get this feeling, and then I'd have to run out, and I'd have to get 24. And then I get that warm, fuzzy feeling. Okay, it's going to be okay. <coughs> it's going to be okay. So I didn't know all that. I just know that I drank too much. That's all I knew. And I just knew that when I started, I couldn't stop. You know? So I sat down. I introduced myself as an alcoholic. You know? And I remember I sat there, and I went to a meeting every day to the 12.30 meeting. And 12.30 meeting, thank God for the clubhouse. Because there were meetings all the time all the time. When there was a holiday and I didn't know what to do with myself on a holiday, I can go to four or five meetings because they would have alcathons. I mean, how great was that? You know, somebody was always there. It may not have been 50 people, but if there was two or three, <coughs> it helped. You know, I sat there for a long time. I wouldn't even get up to go to the bathroom. I wouldn't even get up to get a cup of coffee. I was petrified. I remember when they said you had to get a sponsor. I couldn't get a sponsor. I didn't want to talk to anybody, especially the women. I didn't want to talk to women. I had nothing in common, you know. I remember I got, there was a woman who we used to hang out with. I had a hard life. We used to drink around the pool. Um, it, was, it was very stressful. Um, that's why I drank. 
you know, and we used to sit around and we used to drink wine out of coffee cups. And there was this woman, and she used to walk in. She's my kind of woman. She used to walk in to this party, which was really just four people and some kids. And she used to walk in with a suitcase of beer, a suitcase. And I think to myself, that's my girl. That's my friend. I'm going to hang out with her. And I did. And rumor had it that she went into Alcoholics Anonymous, and lo and behold, she was in that meeting that day. And she came over to me, and she said to me, I've been waiting for you. I've been waiting for you. So I was able to ask her everything. She said, I can't sponsor you. I don't have enough time. Um, but I could help you. And she did. She brought me places. She would get me a cup of coffee because I was afraid to get up. She would introduce me to people. And she introduced me to my first sponsor. And, you know, my first sponsor, a great woman. You know, again, I believe everybody's put in here to teach me something, whether I like it or not. Um, and it's just up to me to learn it. And my first sponsor, she got me to speak. She would call me every day. I loved it. I never had to pick up the phone. She would call me every day. And all she would do was talk about herself. I didn't have to say a word. She'd say, how are you? I'd lie. I'd say, fine. <laughs> she left me alone. What more was there to ask for? I had a sponsor. I had a home group. I made coffee. I'm doing everything I said I was supposed to do. And I'm not drinking. And I'm miserable. 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 So I sat there, had her as a sponsor, listened to her. She would tell me what not to do. What would I do? I would do it. And I always tell the story. She told me um, to stay away from this guy, Peter. And I would be like, should I stay away from him? And she'd be like, A, you're married. Um, little small glitch. And B, he's just so he's a bad boy. So what did I do? I married him. That's what I did. That's what I did. I mean, that's seriously how defiant I was for such a long time. Whether I was in or whether I was out. So, you know... I didn't drink, I went to meetings, I had a sponsor, I took commitments, I sponsored people. I took commitments that nobody else would take, because remember, I'm tough and I'm from Brooklyn. You know, I took Cottage 13, <coughs> that sounds like a horror movie, and it was. It was a triple lockdown. Triple lockdown, either they killed somebody, you know. But hey, the criminally insane needed AA meetings and I was the girl to bring them. But what was I bringing? Not much. I wasn't bringing much. You know, I always kept my commitments. You know, I was taught that. You know, thank God for the Fellowship of Alcoholics Anonymous, because the Fellowship of Alcoholics Anonymous told me that I didn't have to keep a sponsor that I couldn't trust. I didn't have to keep a sponsor that I didn't tell the truth. I could like my sponsor. You know, I thought you didn't have to like it. I know, you, like, you should like your sponsor. You should feel comfortable with your sponsor. And you should get a new sponsor. You know? And I did, and the next sponsor I had gotten got me involved in a lot of service. A lot of service, a lot of detox, a lot of commitments, going and booking, all that great stuff. And I did it, and I took to the Fellowship of Alcoholics Anonymous like a duck takes to water. But here's the problem. I was going on all these commitments. I was treating AA like the dating game. I was a married woman with two wonderful children. My parents would come out from Brooklyn on the weekends to see me, and I was never there because I had to go to an AA meeting. I had a commitment. I had to do this, you know. I was hanging out in the diner. I even started smoking again so I could be cool, you know. That's what I was doing. But I was sitting in that seat, and I was dying. I was dying, you know. So I was doing all these things. I was running around. <coughs> I was not acting like a married woman, my ex-husband, funny, he's my ex-husband, right, would look at me, and this was a picture that Alcoholics Anonymous was bringing. He's like, if this is what AA is, I don't want any part of AA, because I don't see how AA is helping us. Yeah, you're not drinking, but you're not being a wife, and you're not being a mother, you're not being a daughter, you're not being anything. You're never here. You're never here. So the second sponsor who got me involved she had to move in the middle of the night. I still don't know why. She had sent me a letter. I figured it out. I figured out that I don't need to know why. Because honestly, it was the best thing that ever happened to me. And her moving saved my life. Seriously. 
That's what happened. She pulled me into the parking lot. She goes, listen, me and Tom, we got to go. I can't tell you why. You can't get another sponsor for seven days. I said, you know what? I'm done with the sponsoring. The first one was nuts. The second one's moving in the middle of the night. I mean, they cleaned out the house in the middle of the night. I don't even know where they're going. I'm done. I'm done with sponsorship. Obviously, I can do this alone. Well, I mean, they haven't taught me anything, you know? And that's what I tried to do. But again, God puts funny people in your life. There used to be a meeting <clears throat> back then, and yeah, I'm dating myself. You could smoke in Alcoholics Anonymous. You know, picture smoking in a room like this. <clears throat> Honestly, even if you didn't smoke, you were smoking. <laughs> so you might as well smoke. I mean, that was my, that was my crazy reasoning. I used to come home reeking, <clears throat> reeking, you know? You couldn't see the person sitting next to you. <laughs> and we used to be in this meeting, and people would be sharing. It was a discussion meeting. And they'd be talking about things, and I would think to myself, I don't understand. What does this have to do with anything? And then there'd be a voice from the smoke in the back, mm -hmm. a crackling, crazy voice, talking about this stuff, recovery, and the big book, and steps. And people would roll their eyes and say, here he goes again. And I think to myself, I don't know, that guy looks really happy. That guy kind of looks like the village idiot that they're talking about. And I kind of like that. I kind of like that. And then he would come up to me after, and he'd ask me what I'm doing, and I'd say, nothing. <laughs> and he'd say, when are you going to get honest? And I said, I am. And he said, let me know. And you know, after that sponsor had left, a couple of women came over to me. He had told me that the solution to me is in a book. And I need to find somebody to invest some time and take me through the book. And once I go through that book, when I look at those steps, I'm not going to get scared. You know? I mean, don't get me wrong. I knew I was powerless over alcohol. I don't know why. I thought I drank because I liked the taste. And every time I used to say that when I used to share, Greg would be the one in the back just cracking up, just laughing like a crazy man. And I had such a resentment against him, seriously. I was hoping a house would fall on him, you know? And he would just laugh. And I got that. And I knew my life was unmanageable. And I also knew that I stopped drinking, okay? And I did stop drinking for a year and a half. And I sat in that seat, and I got sicker. I got sicker. You know, all that guilt, all that shame, all that remorse, all that fear, all that sex and the harms. See, all that crap that I had, you know, it just kept building up and building up. See, but I didn't have alcohol. I had nothing to dull that pain anymore. So all I had was me. And that was scary. That was scary. Because I was doing just as bad sober as I was when I was out there drinking. The difference was I was remembering it when I was sober. I was remembering it. I knew what I was doing. I knew it was wrong. I just didn't know how to stop. I didn't know how to stop. You know, I couldn't picture life with alcohol. I knew it. I knew I couldn't drink. I got it. But I also can't picture life without alcohol. So what the hell do I do? I kill myself. That's what I do. I kill myself. And that's what I wanted to do. I was at that point. But I had these two wonderful children, and thank God for Jewish guilt. Thank God for a mother that just never stopped. Never stopped. And constantly was saying to me, you need to do something. You know, <clears throat> I got friendly with that, that, that guy that I wasn't supposed to talk to, Peter. And I remember he double dared me and he said to me, why don't you go ask Greg to be your sponsor? And I said, no, no, men with the men and the women with the women. And he goes, oh, yeah, you're really sticking with the women, he said. You're really sticking with the women. With the women. And, you know, I went over finally and I asked him. And the poor guy almost fainted. And he said to me, I don't know if I can do that. I don't know if I can do that. I said, I want somebody to take me through this book, Alcoholics Anonymous. I read it. I don't understand it. It's so boring. I use it to go to sleep at night. I do. 
That's what I used it. That and a doorstop. I don't know what else to do with it. And he said, let me think about it. Let me think about it. He said, I have one condition. He took me to this meeting. He said, there's a woman here, and she takes women through the big book. He's like, if we go there, I want you to ask her if she'll take you through the book. If she'll take you through the book, I'm off the hook. I'm off the hook. If she says no, I'll sponsor you. I'll take you through the book, and I'll get you to the point. And then you're on your own. You're on your own. I said, okay, deal. I remember, I told you, I wasn't a fan of women, and I walked in, and there's this six-foot-two, gorgeous, skinny, blonde chick, surrounded by women, um, and I'm thinking, whoa, I got to talk to her? And he's like, you sure do. Now get yourself over there and go ask her. I walked up. My knees were knocking. I said, to her, hi, I'm Iris. Will you sponsor me and take me through the book Alcoholics Anonymous? She turned around, and she said, no, I'm too busy. I'm too busy. And I said, okay, great, nice meeting you. And I ran back to the little crazy man. I said, and he's like, what'd she say? What'd she say? And I said, she said no. And he goes, no, she didn't. I said, no, no, she did. She said she was too busy. He's like, she said what? And he went storming over there. And Greg's really tall, and she was really, really, I mean, short. And she was really, really tall. It was really funny. And I see him talk to her, and he comes back. He grabs me by my, my um, elbow. He's like, we're leaving. And I said, okay. And he said to me outside in the car, it was in a Middletown meeting, and he said to me, um, I'll take you through the book. I'll take you through the book. But there's a couple of things we have to, you know, get right. First and foremost, once I start taking you through the book, you will never say to any woman that comes over to you that you are too busy. You will never, ever decide who you are going to sponsor or take through the book Alcoholics Anonymous. Never. And at that time I said, deal. You know, because desperation is so motivating, you know. You're at that point where you will do anything. And I'm saying, yeah, I'll do it, you know. He said, we're going to meet every Wednesday. You're going to be on time. This is what you're going to bring. And you're going to bring an Entenmann's cake. Because I work nights, I'm going to be waking up, and I'm going to need it. If you show up at my door without an Entenmann's cake, don't show up. He's like, you will be on time. You will not be late. You will do everything I say. Everything I say. You got it? I'm not a marriage counselor. I'm not a lawyer. I'm not a doctor. And the first thing he did make me do was go over to the doctor that, in my book, saved me thank him and tell him I will no longer be coming, which I did. Bless him. And then I started doing everything that he said I had to do. I showed up on time. I brought an Entenmann's cake. And what happened was he read to me. You know, page 17 of the big book, and, you know, it's funny because it's my favorite page. It says we are people that normally would not mix. You know, we are people. Look, we are, you know. Um, I've met so many amazing people in Alcoholics Anonymous. And the funny thing is, here I was living in a five-bedroom, three-bathroom house, and here was this guy who lived in a box under a bridge on Route 17 in Paramus. And I'm going to listen to everything <coughs> he says. He could barely read. He can barely read. But he sat there, and he read to me. And I listened to everything he said. You know, how did he learn to read? Joe and Charlie. You know, I talked about this when I was up in Quakertown. I was a Joe and Charlie stalker. Um, <laughs> my big book is signed in more places, every time I turn by Joe and Charlie, than anybody. I mean, I would go over to them, and they'd be like, come on, really? Again? <laughs> I've signed it. I just signed it. One more time. And they'd be like, oh, my God. I mean, I was so lucky. We were just talking about that. I got to spend the weekend, you know, may they rest in peace with Joe McCoy up in um, the Wilson house. You want to talk about the blessings that I have had in my life, you know? Um, it, it's, it's amazing. It's amazing. It's amazing. You know, and that's where he learned how to read from the big book. And he was not, by any means, the village idiot, you know? 
he would make me look up these words. I mean, I always tease for Christmas. He, you know, he got me, um, he got me a dictionary. I mean, come on, that's like getting your mother a vacuum cleaner. Mm. Who wants a dictionary for a Christmas present? <coughs> Not me. And he got me an old one. And I'm like, this isn't even a new dictionary. It's used. <laughs> and he said, it's exactly what we need. I said, a used 1950 dictionary? Come on. And he's like, it's exactly what we need. And what he would do is he would make me look up all these words, and then he would write them in his book, okay? He would just write them all down. It was the funniest thing. And I'd be like, what is he writing? You know, it's every word, blah, blah, blah. Because he didn't know what, he always didn't know what all of them meant. Mm -hmm. And then as we're going through, you know, we started learning. And then what he did is he took me to my first Joe and Charlie, Twin Towers. Um, they're talking a, talking a lot of years ago. And I remember that weekend... And I remember listening to Joe and Charlie, and Greg was sitting in front of me with his sponsor. And uh, I was sitting in a row with a bunch of people. And everything they were saying, he said. He said. And he turned around, and he looked me dead in the face. He said to me, I never told you I was an original. <laughs> it's just the way I learned it. You know, and it didn't change a thing. Because while we were sitting going through that book, I was getting my own experience with that book. And he was getting his own experience with that book. You know? And regardless of the drama and the nonsense that went around, because the women were with the women and the men were with the men, he didn't care. He didn't care. He knew that it was his responsibility when anybody in anything in AA reaches out their hand, we got to be there. End of story. And he had to be there. You know, it's really lucky. We turned in, we had a great 12 year run. And you know, um, what happened was women got big book savvy and started going through the big book and, you know, I was able to turn around and I was able to sponsor a whole bunch of women and find a woman that um, I had the experience with and, you know, that's who I used to sponsor me right now. I always fall back a lot of times on Greg though and always will because if that guy did not say yes and did not invest just an hour and a half of his week with me and take me through that book. All we did, we read the black. That's all we did. It wasn't anything crazy, fancy. You know, we read the black. I followed the directions. Um, and we built a relationship. That's what happened. And you know what he taught me? He taught me how to pray. That's what he taught me. You know, I came in with this crazy conception of God. Um, and the conception of God that I came in Alcoholics Anonymous, it's not, you know, any different than a lot of other people. You know, my God was, a, in my head, was a punishing God. That's what my God was. You know, if you fell down, if you fell off your bicycle, if you scraped your knee, if your goldfish died, if your gerbil died, what well, was God? It's God punishing you either for something you did, something you were thinking about doing, you know, something you were plotting, something along those lines. So as soon as I was able to get away from God and the rabbi, because I was schooled by the rabbi's daughter, good times. I used to sit there thinking so many different ways of getting out that window. <laughs> as soon as she left, thinking how to get out that window. You know, so as soon as I can get away, I got away. And I did. And I decided that I will have no part of God. You know, so when I looked at those steps, I was scared. Because those steps talked about God. And if I needed God... I'm screwed, because I don't want to be part of God. So how are you going to even make this attractive to me? But he did. He did. Thank God for sponsorship with a great sense of humor. Someone who can teach me how to laugh at myself. Someone who can teach me that those old ideas are just old ideas. They're just superstitions. Superstitions, like the black cat walking under a ladder. I mean, every superstition I had... He made me act out. And then when nothing bad happened, like a bolt of lightning didn't come down and strike me dead, or my mother didn't call on the phone, you know, he would be, and how's that working for you? How's that working for you? You know, when I came in, I didn't know the serenity prayer. I didn't know the Our Father. How would I know that? It's not anything I've ever learned. So how would I know it? So when I, everybody would pray, I didn't pray because I didn't know the prayer. And I thought I didn't have to learn them. 
So the first thing he started doing is he started teaching me all these prayers. And I remember when we were following the steps and we got to the third step. And he said to me, we're going to get on our knees and we're going to say the third step. And I said, nope, I don't do that. I don't do that. I was raised that we just don't do that. We can stand and say the third step because that's what we do. He's like, no, we're going to get on our knees and we're going to say the third step. That's what we're going to do. You know, he always had this great line, and that great line was, how well do you want to be? How well do you want to be? You know? <coughs> and I used to always say, I want to be really well. And he'd be like, we're going to say a third step on our knees. If he tells the story, he'll tell you I kept one knee up, but since I'm telling the story and he's all the way back in freehold, <laughs> he won't say anything. I was good. I got on my knees, we said the third step. You know? Um, nothing bad happened. The lightning bulb didn't come. Mom didn't find out. <laughs> nothing bad happened. And you know, since that experience, wow, I have said that prayer so many places, so many places, parking lot, churches, St. Patrick's in the city. Um, I, I can't tell you the experiences that I've had. Saying that third step with so many different people on my knees, you know. Um, are just, just amazing experiences. So after that, I started writing my fourth step. You know, we had already built a relationship. So by the time I sat down to do my fifth step, you know, and I, Greg used to work nights, so <coughs> I fed him. I got an Entenmann's cake, and I figured we'd go through this. I had already written it, so I knew that it wasn't that good. You know, my whole life, I was a victim. I was a victim. It was always what you were doing to me. Never once did it cross my mind, nor did I care what I was doing to you. Because you were doing it to me. You know, you want to talk about retaliation? It was my middle name. I mean, I can just stop talking to you and you're dead. It's how I lived my life. You know, I'll just ignore you, you'll go away. <laughs> That's it. You know, so I was the victim. Not you. Not you. And as soon as I started writing, I started saying that maybe that wasn't true. You know, just maybe that wasn't true. You know, and again, thank God for good sponsorship, good people in my life. I had two things in my life that I was taking to my grave. My grave. You know, there were two terrible things that happened to me. And I just didn't want to put them down on paper. I was petrified. I was told never to tell by my family. Um... And I thought if I told, you know, if I don't put it down, then it, it doesn't matter, right? And all I remember was honest and thorough, honest and thorough, honest and thorough. And people would say to me, oh, it's just as honest and thorough as you can be at that time. But again, thank God for great sponsorship. No, it's honest and thorough, period. So I remember the first time I shared it with my then husband, Peter, and I told him, and he didn't go running from the room. He turned around and he shared something with me. Um, and uh, he taught me how to write it down. And the second one I called, and we sat down, and we wrote it down, and I got everything that I was going to take to my grave, I got it on paper. I got it on paper, I shared it with another person, and I no longer have to take it to my grave. He told me, these are things you don't need to talk about from the podium. What you talk about from the podium, you don't have to talk about that and make other people uncomfortable. It's something that you can share when you're working with the women you work with one-on-one. -on -one. And I do. I always do. You know, I've heard a lot of crazy things, a lot of crazy fist steps. Um, and it's, you know, it's a sharing and a giving and a taking. Um, so we sat down, we did it. I was a guest, you know. I saw those character defects, but when they came out of my sponsor's mouth, that you are a selfish, self-centered, inconsiderate, frightened, and he made some more up that really weren't nice. <laughs> <laughs> I'll use brat, um, which I was, uh, and kind of what we have to work on. I'm going to be working on column three. <coughs> I'm going to be working on column five. He made my amends list. If I would have had made it, there wouldn't have been any names on it. You know, even sitting there doing it, there wouldn't have been any names on it. He made the now, he made the prayer, he made the now, he made the la later, and he made the never. There was nobody ever in that never column. 
It was just, that's it. And then you know what he did? He turned up the heat. I thought I was going to feel this big relief after I did my fist stop. I didn't. I didn't. You know, I felt awful. Because now all this stuff that I've done my whole life, I realize, no, you're not a victim, but you left a lot of victims in your wake, boy. You certainly did. You certainly did. So he made the amends list. He turned up the heat. There was no resting. There was no resting. And I did exactly what he said. I started sponsoring, and I sponsored a lot of women. I kept really, 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 really busy. My dining room kind of turned into an AA meeting. You know, when you talk about, I was a year and a half sober, so I'm going to be celebrating 24. You're talking about, like, 22 years ago. The big book was not popular 22 years ago. You know, the steps were truly worked out of the uh, 12 and 12. And no matter what you did, if you would try to explain that, you know, if you shared big book sharing back then, you were called a big book thumper, you were called a big book Nazi, and I already told you I'm Jewish, it just didn't fit together. <laughs> I used to say to Greg, I'm so confused, and he used to go, don't listen. Just don't listen. There were times we used to go to a meeting, and Greg used to say to me, why don't you go start the car? Because <laughs> I don't know how many people are going to come to the podium thanking us. You know? And then I started Cold Snack. And I started Cold Snack Steps by the book. Do you know why? Because going through those steps, doing that work, getting a conception of my own God, having a spiritual, very slow awakening, and torturous some days. You know, it's still, it's still happening. And I thank God for that. I still learn things the hard way. And I haven't been blessed smart. Um, you know, I still got to work for what I work for. A lot. You know, I still like sometimes doing things the hard way. But I started Cold Snack 20 years ago. And, you know, I started as a women's meeting. And the only women that came to that meeting were the women that I sponsored. Because they were really afraid not to come which was probably smart at that time. And, you know, I realized, again, good sponsorship introduces you to the steps. You know, doing that work is not me doing those steps. It's me taking somebody else through the steps. So good sponsorship does that. Then introduces you to the traditions, which happen. It got me into service. So I knew that that meeting was not self-supporting. So I had to do something. And I went to my husband at the time. who, um, And I went to Greg. And I went to a couple other people who had the same experience as me. And I said, I need more people. We're not self-supporting. So if I'm only having women, how do I get more people? I'm going <coughs> to add men. You know? And as soon as I added men, all the women went away. You know how many men's meetings I've been to when I started Cult Snap? Um, but little by slowly, it started taking off. And other meetings from Cult Snap grew. And the big book grew. And people getting recovered grew. You know, my experience that, that I've had... Um, and it hasn't, by no means, and if I sit here and tell you that every day is hunky-dory, it's not. Um, not at all. You know, I've been having a little bit of a hard time, new job. I mean, the gifts of Alcoholics Anonymous let me, at 57 years old, accept a job, totally new career, at 57 years old. There's days I think to myself, are you insane? Why would you do this? You know, I'm a single woman. 57, just to think about retiring. Yeah, no. I decided to take a whole new career. That's what I decided. And it's because of this program that's taught me that fear is not going to hold me back. You know, before I got up here to speak, as long as I have been speaking, I go into the bathroom. And thank God this was a nice, clean bathroom. <laughs> I go into the bathroom, I hit my knees. I hit my knees. You know, you'll see my feet sticking out from underneath the stall. <laughs> I've been in some pretty rough bathrooms. And I recite the fear prayer. And all I do is I just ask God to remove my fear and to direct my thinking and to help one person in this room. 
Just one. You know, I don't have enough for everybody. Just one. That's all I need to do, and I've done my job in Doylestown. That's it, if I just help one person. But the gifts that I've got from this program and the people that I've met in this program, it's amazing. My life and the things that I'm capable of doing because I have a God in my life and because I'm never alone. Somebody had asked me the other day, aren't you lonely? I have three dogs and I'm not lonely. I said, no, because I'm never alone. And as corny as that sounds, they were a little befuddled. I didn't feel the necessity to explain, you know. But I'm not. I'm never alone. If I choose to be pathetic, I can be pathetic still. If I choose to be recovered, which I do, then I'm recovered. And then I'm no longer hopeless and helpless. I'm happy. And I can do my job, you know. Um, I want to thank you all for being here. It's a lovely town, Doyle's town. It really is. It's beautiful. I didn't even realize. It's right behind New Hope. Um, like, where's Doyle's town? Um, thank you again. It was a pleasure meeting all of you. And have a good night. Next week, we have Alan S. out of Manhattan. Uh, I forgot the one announcement on next month, April 27th. It's our anniversary. It'll be a workshop. They'll start at 10 a.m. It'll be in our big room. Uh, don't miss that. It's all free with a free lunch. I always say, if your sponsor ever tells you there's no such thing as a free lunch, come bring them. We got one of them. But what we have, uh, we'll have probably somewhere between five and seven speakers doing uh, a big book layout of the 12 steps. Uh, it's, it's always eventful. If you're thinking about staying down AA and, and seeking recovery, we like to always do them. We usually have three of them a year. So if you watch that website, you'll find that. We got a nice, well, let's thank Iris one more time. Thank you very much. I know we're tight on space, but it's customary to like kind of form a line and thank our speakers. They come here at their own time and expense, so let's we'll just stand where we're at and say that uh, if you care to join us, we'll end it with the Lord's Prayer where we're at. Take a moment of silence, do with it whatever you like, and if you care to join us, we'll end with the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Keep coming back. Good job.